It's 2022, a new year, a new season, and a new distro. We're starting this one with a non-Linux distro. It's GhostBSD. And let's start it out with a bit of trivia. Did you know that GhostBSD is a Canadian distro? Did you know that the name GhostBSD actually means something? It stands for GNOME Hosted on BSD. Or actually, it's GTK Hosted on BSD because it uses a GTK front end. GhostBSD is to FreeBSD as something like Endeavor OS is to Arch Linux. It installs a FreeBSD with some handy tools, including a desktop, but it doesn't really try to be its own distro the way that Ubuntu is to Debian. The project website is pretty okay. The landing page is basically just a blog, but there's also a PHPB forum and a media wiki with some cool information in there. It's not Arch or Debian levels of wiki, but there's still some good stuff in there pertaining to GhostBSD in general. This version of GhostBSD was released on January 17th, so I'm late as usual covering this. To be fair though, this is the first episode of 2022, and I feel like this is the first real episode of Distro Delves in a long time. The GhostBSD installer is nice. It reminds me of Ubuntu's old Ubiquity installer. It's pretty run of the mill, but it does showcase some things that BSD does different, such as using the ZFS file system for root and offering lots of alternative shells and stuff out of the box. The overall install was pretty quick too, so yeah, earlier I said this felt like an OG episode of Distro Delves, and that's in large part because this is on real hardware, and I kind of planned out this episode, and I tested it on the hardware and also the VM and stuff. I like to test drive things in VMs first because it gives me a chance to kind of get a feel for what things are going to look like and see the differences on a VM before putting it on hardware. But funnily enough, GhostBSD did not like Kimu, and it didn't like VirtualBox much either. Actually, it seemed like GhostBSD hated everything. The inbuilt Wi-Fi adapter is Intel, but GhostBSD didn't recognize it at all, which is kind of ass. This happened again briefly in the VirtualBox VM. I thought I was going crazy because I was certain that I saw it on the hardware box, which I did, but then it happened again on VirtualBox, but then I restarted it and it was fine. I don't know. And the issue with Kimu is that Ghost didn't like the display or the sound card at all, and the session was just more or less not usable. A fresh Ghost BSD install weighs in at about 7 gigabytes, which is on the low end of a standard Nix distro. And I think that might be due to how FreeBSD reports the memory usage or free memory, but... An interesting thing to me is that a lot of the standard tools that I'm used to working with in Terminal simply aren't available on FreeBSD, so that's like free, which is a CLI tool I use to get the available memory and stuff. The NeoFetch looks cool, but you can see that it's Beastie from FreeBSD instead of the GhostBSD logo. The desktop is GTK all the way down, with the Matei desktop 1.26, a Vimex theme, and Qogre icons. The typefaces are Droid Sans, which are pretty old at this point, but I think that they've aged really well. The desktop uses a standard set of Matei apps, but VLC is the media player and Fish is the default shell. It also pre-installs Evolution, which is not a default Matei app, and it feels like a weird choice because with Firefox being the web browser and Evolution kind of being its own thing, I feel like if you really needed an email client, Thunderbird would make more sense. But it is interesting that Evolution runs on BSD, so if you absolutely needed it and you wanted to use BSD, I guess you could. Overall, the desktop is snappy, but very bland, like the desktop layout is. Luckily, there's Station Tweaks, which is basically just a fork of Matei Tweaks, and it comes with other desktop layouts. There's also Software Station and Station Updater. The Software Station is honestly not good. It reminds me a bit of Apper or the old GTK software app on Debian. You can search for software, but it does a real-time search as soon as you start typing, so it's more like a filter and it doesn't work very well. For software that has multiple entries, it just duplicates them. Even though there's actual differences in the package, you wouldn't be able to tell from the GUI. Very strange design choice. And while we're here, it's worth mentioning that FreeBSD uses the PKG package manager and GhostBSD provides its own software ports, but I honestly don't know too much about BSD ports and we're just not gonna get into it here. And lastly about the desktop, there's no firmware installer or anything that helps you find drivers and stuff. So if you do need obscure drivers, you'll just kind of have to figure it out yourself. 
The file manager is Kaja, and it handles external media like USB drives just fine, but it did not recognize my Lux encrypted partition or the drive it was on at all. There's also no RAR support or 7-zip support. It played all of the audio files just fine, but it did struggle a bit with video playback. There was no audio for the DivX and Flash files, and the playback in general just kinda got more choppy the more I watched. You can actually see that the video chop seems to align with the CPU spikes in the graph in the task manager, so I'm just gonna guess this is a driver issue. So at this stage of the episode, I'd normally go through the paces of testing the performance with various tools and playing some other 3D games and stuff, but the lack of internet on the hardware box and the various gremlins in the VM put a stop to that plan. Honestly, BSD is a bit of an anomaly to me. GhostBSD seems cool, but it feels like what a Linux distro was a decade ago. Now a lot of you may not know, I started on BSD. My very first non-Windows OS was PC BSD way back in the day, I think it's called TrueOS now. And it ran KDE 3.5, so this was before they switched to the Lumina or Lumia, whatever desktop they did. It's weird to me that FreeBSD in particular has really good vendor support. NVIDIA officially supports it with the FreeBSD binary driver. I think Sony's Orbit OS is based on FreeBSD, but other actual open source things just don't seem to work out of the box, and I would totally expect them to. But that's enough about BSD, let's talk a little bit about Haunted Mansion as we wrap this episode up. A vanilla DOS box was available from the repos and the game fired right up without any issues, which shouldn't be surprising. But I even had sound here in VirtualBox, which is cool. Now Haunted Mansion is an old, old DOS game, and it's unfortunately a game I missed out on as a kid. I don't really know how because I played so many OG DOS games when I was younger because I had a collection of CDs with like shareware and shovelware, and maybe this game was on there and I never saw it, but I would have loved it. It's a super simple DOS platformer game, really easy to pick up and start playing, but it also has a unique game mechanic in that you can run out of ammo, you have to stop, reload, but that leaves you vulnerable. As with any platformer, there's going to be cheap shots here and there. It's one of those one-hit death games, and some of the enemies move pretty fast so that you can't escape them unless you know that they're going to be there. There's these little throwing knives that are so small you can hardly see them. The blobs and spiders can come off screen to kill you, so again, unless you know that they're there, they're going to get you. And I should have clarified when I started talking about the game, this isn't called Haunted Mansion. It's actually called Dangerous Dave in Haunted Mansion, or in the Haunted Mansion. Dangerous Dave, like the guy in the game itself, was an older platformer game developed by John Romero when he worked at Softdisk, and it was completely different. There's a whole bunch of other Dangerous Dave games, like in Trophy Trouble, Dangerous Dave Returns, and Risky Rescue, and all these other really good ones. But anyways, this was an episode about Ghost BSD, and I think we're done here. Subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more Distro Delves episodes on new, old, and interesting operating systems. I'm going to try to do at least one a month this year. I know that doesn't sound like much, but I did, I think, a total of like five last year. So doubling that number seems like a good place to start. I appreciate all your support, and thanks for watching.